morning, everybody, and welcome to the eighth meeting in this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Please remember to switch off your electronics as they can interfere with the broadcasting system. Agenda item one today is a decision on taking a business in private. Uh, first item for the committee to decide is whether agenda item four today, its uh, climate change budget mainstreaming review, should be taken in private. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. So we will take it in private later. Uh, agenda item two is subordinate legislation. Uh, this agenda <laughs> item um, is for members to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary uh, on the proposed draft Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2003 Remedial Order 2014. Uh, the instrument has been laid under affirmative procedure, which means that the Parliament must approve it before provisions may come into force. Following uh, this evidence session, the Committee will be invited to consider the motion uh, to approve the instrument under Agenda uh, Item 3 as we come to that. Um, well, I welcome uh, Richard Lockhead, Cabinet Secretary, uh, and his team, David Balhari, Project Team Leader on the ECHR Compliance Order, and uh, Paul Kakett, the Deputy Solicitor and Head of Group 2 in the Scottish Government. And I ask the Cabinet Secretary to speak to the instrument first. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Convener and the rest of the committee. Uh, can I thank you for the opportunity just to say a few words? and a view, uh, as brief as I can, what has been a very challenging and complex process in relation to this issue. The draft Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2003 remedial order is now before you and has been subject to the super affirmative process, as you indicated, convener. As you will recall, the order came about as a result of a decision by the Supreme Court in April 2013, which ruled that an anti-avoidance provision included within the 2003 Act for any landlord who served a notice to quit during the period of September 2002 to June 2003 was contrary to the landlord's human rights as it was arbitrary and disproportionate. The Supreme Court therefore gave the Scottish Parliament, guided by ministers until April this year, to consider, in consultation with the industry, solutions which respect a landlord's human rights under the European Convention on Human Rights and to bring these solutions into effect. So throughout the drafting process, stakeholders have engaged positively with my officials to find solutions to these very complex and difficult issues, and I'm extremely grateful to all those who have helped find the best possible solution. As part of the super affirmative process, there was a 60-day period of consultation, and that's a public consultation, during which time detailed responses were received from key stakeholder groups, individual tenants and landlords and much appreciated detailed responses from both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and you, this committee, as well. So working with officials, I have considered all the points raised and have, been provided a, uh, have provided a detailed response in the statement of observations and reasons which you hopefully have all seen and which was laid before the Parliament on the 6th of March. The draft order remains by and large the same as the proposed draft order which you saw previously. In addition to tidying up changes, there were two amendments that I would like to draw your attention to. Firstly, a new Article 3.4 has been provided to make it clear that any decision by the Scottish Land Court as a result of the order can be appealed. Secondly, Article 4.2 has been changed. Once the order comes into force, landlords who have received a claim by tenants for the tenancy now have 28 days to apply to the Scottish Land Court. The change here is pretty technical. The previous version inadvertently provided 27 days notice. So we've amended it to ensure the full 28 days is provided in the order. So while these changes may appear minor, <laughs> I am grateful to those who scrutinised the proposed draft order and helped identify the need for the two changes. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the draft order on the 11th of March and expressed that it was content with both the draft order and the responses to all the issues raised during the consultation. During the consultation, we also received helpful comments on two key aspects beyond the detail of the legislative fix. The first was the need to provide clear and concise guidance in plain English for everyone to uh, understand who's affected. And I am mindful that it's extremely important that uh, my officials are working uh, on this uh, to ensure that is the case, and they are working to produce this guidance uh, so that it can be published alongside the final order and the guidance will be in plain English as far as possible. The second key aspect was the offer of mediation to which I committed uh, on the 15th of January. 
and I'm pleased to report that a mediation process is currently being developed in consultation with key stakeholders and we have to have that agreed by uh, the time the order comes into force. So just to reach a conclusion, uh, this of course, as you're all well aware, has been an extremely complex legal case and the super affirmative process used to process the order has provided an ideal opportunity to engage with and understand the views of stakeholders at the same time as allowing for parliamentary scrutiny. The use of this process has given us confidence that the order strikes an appropriate balance between the interests of tenants and landlords. And as I've said before, there is now a real opportunity for reconciliation and I sincerely hope that those affected will take advantage of the mediation and offer to help find the best possible solutions for everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And uh, I would ask members if they wish to ask any questions at the moment. Uh, this is the time to do so when you can include the officials, because in the next item, the officials are excluded from any questions. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and, and um, the two officials as well. Uh, could, could I just ask at this stage for the um, clarification, which you have already given, I'm aware of that, um, Cabinet Secretary, about the support from Scottish Government for the mediation process? I think that just would be good. Um, to have that on the record, please. Um, <clears throat> well, we are engaging with professionals in the sectors in terms of those who are expert at mediation, uh, and that process is now being set up as we speak. So once the order comes into play uh, and uh, is through the process, that process will actually start through the cooling off period, which is, as you know, part of the process moving forward between now or when the order comes into force in November and during that period mediation will be made available to all uh, concerned parties uh, and the budget is there and I, I did say to you before that if you know the demand for the budget is uh, so great that we have to uh, give to additional resources of course we'll be sympathetic towards that. Thank you. Mike Lyle. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can I, again, I think you were asked the last time, um, the numbers affected, uh, I'll read from a paragraph, we consider 20 or, or so farms or tenancies face being directly affected, um, but we don't have an exact figure. We feel the number may be double rather than treble. Do we know exactly how many are affected? No, we don't know exactly how many people are affected. Um, as indicated to the committee before, the good news is that when we first had the court judgment, we were concerned there might be, you know, we, we, we didn't know, but it could be hundreds of people affected or scores. Uh, thankfully, all the investigations working with key stakeholders has whittled down the estimate of people affected to a reasonably modest number. And we will not know the exact numbers because people, in theory, could keep coming out of the woodwork through the cooling off period once the, the guidance is available, once stakeholders again are going back to their memberships. So, you know, there could be more coming out of the, the woodwork. So the signs are it's quite a modest number. As, as you know, there's various groups of people we've, we think are affected. There's, we've divided it into five different groups. Uh, and the first three groups are the mo ones most affected. There's 20 in group one, five or six in group two, five or six in group three. So that's a, a ballpark figure of how many people should be directly affected. There are other groups, um, and again, group four and five, we've got, we think one person in group four and perhaps 15 or so in group five, uh, but there are people who've perhaps put new arrangements in place that have taken them beyond the order. So the first three groups are the most important. What exactly, through you, convener, what exactly would this be, after the order is laid and, and passed, what exactly would it be published on the Scottish Government website or uh, in a, in a, new, a, a national newspaper, etc., a press release been put out? We'll be using the media, uh, as we have done before, and uh, the specialist farming press, which is read to a great degree by the farmers in Scotland, uh, have given this a lot of airtime already, and no doubt will continue to do so once the final order is made available. It will be made available through the usual parliamentary channels, and because we're working very closely with all the stakeholder groups, uh, they in turn were hoping we'll make it available to all their members. There's various events been taking place, uh, officials have been speaking at various events, uh, and there's quite a high awareness of, of this issue. But clearly, because of the legalities involved, you know, 
there's still an opportunity for more people to come out of the woodwork once they get their head around the legalities and, and details. And we'll be issuing guidance in plain English, as I indicated in my opening remarks. So once that's out there, perhaps people will understand the issues a bit more and how relevant it is to their own circumstances. So there's potential for more people to come out of the woodwork. If I could ask one last question. Um, I asked you the last time about compensation, uh, and you said that you were um, open uh, what position is the government's situation now in regards to possible compensation claims? It's unchanged. We have said on record we will look sympathetically on particular cases that may uh, involve that as part of the, the way forward. But our absolute focus is on mediation, and we have that opportunity for mediation. Uh, because a huge amount of effort has been put into each individual circumstance, it's difficult to give a broad brush answer to what each case may require at this point. Uh, but we have said where there is clearly a strong case for compensation, uh, we will look upon that sympathetically. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Richard and, and, and company. Um, just regarding time bar, it, it clearly states in your document that the government will not provide advice on any potential time bars. It would be interesting to explore why they wouldn't do that. I mean, obviously, quite often in, in, in such cases, there's maybe a, a five-year five time bar, that sort of thing, which would be long, long past, of course. So it would be interesting to maybe explore a little bit more, if possible, um, the implications behind why the government can't give advice on time bar. Well, clearly, because we cannot anticipate where some of these cases may end up in the, the judicial process, any comment we give as a government in terms of where we think time bars apply to different parts of the legislation could prejudice our position in the courts. Um, so we would, uh, by convention, not go into detail of, of time bars. Also, the usual way in which time bars are decided is by the courts themselves. So they would interpret the legislation and decide what the view was of the time bar. So anyone who wanted to pin down time bar, challenge the legislation, would be able to go to the courts and ask them to decide what the time bar was. Ferguson. Just to follow up on that point, if I could, um, Cabinet Secretary, good morning, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think I understand this right, but again, just to get this on the record, you have stated that any period of time that came under consideration in a time bar would not begin until the period of mediation was uh, completed. Is that correct? So that's for groups one, two, and three, I think. Uh, yes, that's right. Is that right? So we've, we've got, got the cooling-off period to November, mm. and then one year from November for uh, landlords to serve, to convert, to convert to... So no, away from 1991 tenancies. And no time bar clock would start until the end of that period. Correct. That's correct, yes. I might just add, in, 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 on the plain English uh, aspect, which I thoroughly agree with, I'm not sure that uh, the expression treat a clock to start for the purposes of time bar quite falls into that. I think there's, a room, <laughs> there's room for improvement yet. I think. <laughs> but thank you for that. Thank you for They're that always learning on how to promote plain English, and hopefully within 50 or 70 years we'll be there. <laughs> Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, during the evidence sessions that we held, I think pretty much every stakeholder expressed the view that there was a desire to bring about resolution of the situation swiftly and appropriately and to avoid a gravy train uh, leaving the station. What part do you feel those stakeholders can play in actually delivering on that? I mean, would you be looking for the NFUS, et cetera, et cetera, to be encouraging their members who are affected by these situations to set about this in the right way and, to, and hopefully go for mediation as a means of resolving it quickly? Yes, I would do so. And as I indicated before, we've had very productive conversations and help from all stakeholders groups, from those representing tenants and landlords, those representing both. And no one wanted to be here where we are at the moment, but we are here and we're dealing with it as best we can. And the committee has been very supportive of, of, of that approach. So I, I am hopeful and I expect, and I have no reason not to expect, all stakeholders to be reasonable and um, promote the route of mediation in the first instance. Uh, and as I said, so far I've been working very closely with them and that's indications we do have. Thank you. I have a question just now about uh, the order itself. 
Um, I don't know whether you've had any discussions with the Supreme Court, because, of course, we can pass this order, uh, which we hope can be dealt with and that it will be acceptable. Are there any lines of communication uh, with the Supreme Court that you can tell us about? I'll ask Paul to come in on the relationship between ourselves and the Supreme Court. We actually gave consideration as to whether, as part of our process to ensure compatibility, uh, we should consult with the Supreme Court. We, we, we took the view that because the Supreme Court might end up adjudicating on mm. the legality of this particular order, it would not be appropriate for them to be asked or to express an opinion as to whether this actually was the fix uh, that would, 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 would meet the, 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 well, the concerns that they raised. So it was something I did actively think about, uh, but we decided that it would not be something that would be appropriate or be welcomed by the court. They might, as I say, ultimately be adjudicating on, the, um, on a matter arising from this. Thank you very much for that. Any further questions? If not, then we'll move on to agenda item three. And the third item today is to consider motion S4M 09333, uh, asking for the committee to recommend approval of the affirmative instrument, the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2003 Remedial Order 2014 draft. So the motion will be moved uh, by the cabinet secretary with an opportunity for a formal debate on the SSI, which can procedurally last up to 90 minutes if required. In practice, I suppose most of the issues have been covered, but of course, to repeat myself, the officials cannot be asked questions during this. I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak and move the motion. Uh, well, clearly I've laid out the, the background to the committee, and once again, I want to thank the, com the committee for all their input to this issue. I think one of the reasons why we have, hopefully, a very robust fix before us is because of the additional parliamentary scrutiny focusing on, on this particular issue because of the, the circumstances we find ourselves in. So hopefully this is a fix, a fix that will be effective, which is proportionate and which is reasonable and hopefully will allow us to move on as quickly as possible once the mediation um, and the following year's window of opportunity to convert is passed. Uh, again, we didn't want to be here. My focus has been to minimise disruption to tenants who would, of course, be shocked to find out that the circumstances they thought they were in were not perhaps as what they thought. Uh, at the same time, we've tried to be fair to both landlords as well as tenants. So I, I don't have anything else to add to my original comments other than to thank the committee. And also, uh, my officials have uh, been painstakingly working with uh, all stakeholders and trying to find a way through this very complex legal issue and I, I thank my officials for all their support as well because they've used very imaginative ways uh, and consensual ways working with all stakeholders to move forward. Thank you very much. Um, are there any members who wish to say anything at the moment? Nigel Don. Yeah, th thank, thank you, Convener. I, 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 I would and I'm not quite sure of course which, which committee hat I'm wearing at this time but uh, let's just not worry too much about that. Can I say that from my perspective, it, this is as good a solution as possible, and, and uh, I, I'd just like to reflect that. Um, I'm also grateful to the Government, the Government Secretary, for having a, a very good look at the possible good faith agreements in Group 2, which did raise their, their heads, albeit hypothetically. Um, I, I've had a good look at the very long paragraph at the head of page 21 of the copy I've got, uh, which begins on balance, we do not accept the suggestion. I have to say, I think that's exemplary. I mean, I, I, I'm only mentioning it because I think it does lay down very clearly what's had to be looked at and, and, and how it's been addressed. Uh, and I think it does sum up our thinking on the subject. So thank you very much. Um, if the Supreme Court at the end of the day does feel that we've got this wrong, um, then I've got to say it's despite the very best endeavours of everybody in this room. <laughs> You know, I really do think that we can reflect on a process that's been well done and thoroughly and energetically been addressed. And in that context, Convener, I would like to thank our parliamentary legal advisers, because frankly they have done a huge amount of work. I think the Cabinet Secretary has already acknowledged that. This has been a team effort and I think it would be important to, to register that they have done that. So with that, I have to say I'm very content with what we finished up with. Um, Any other comments from members? Um, I'd just like to make some comments myself, um, notwithstanding 
the circumstances of uh, the collaboration to try and find our way uh, from uh, the problem to a solution that's acceptable to all. I just wanted to reflect for a moment on the circumstances of the ministerial decision in 2003. Uh, the, content, the context of that was a widespread conversation among landowners on the possibility of the absolute right to buy, which was being discussed at length in this committee, the Rural Affairs Committee at that time, and also amongst tenants. The preemptive uh, serving of notices on limited partnership tenants stemmed from a feeling that they might be included with the 1991 secure tenants in any absolute right to buy. Uh, indeed, um, the irony is that uh, the then executive did not decide to back the absolute right to buy uh, for secure tenants, far less for limited duration tenants. Nevertheless, the exercise of the landlord's actions heightened the tensions in the debate and prompted the passage of clauses which precluded ending uh, limited partnership tenancies during the passage of the then bill. It should not be forgotten that debates about the CAP reform were also in hand in 2002-03 and the terms of the historic payment rights had yet to be agreed. However, subsequent experience of the issue has always focused on the wish to maximise single farm payments, either by outright ownership or by buying and selling entitlements. Now, comments yesterday by Rog Wood in the Herald in his farming column notes the sudden decision of Scottish land and estates to offer a year's amnesty for farm tenancy improvements. And he points out the impasse which had arisen uh, because uh, both landlords and tenants are reluctant to invest if there's no clear uh, security in the future. And uh, indeed, uh, the, most of the improvements uh, that have been made are ones which are contested at the point of Wago, a matter which is still under debate at this time. This is described by Wood as a desperate bid to ward off the uh, absolute right to buy. He may have his views but I only state what he says. So in relation to this order we're debating today, the heightened tensions in 2002-03 have not yet been resolved. The human rights issue of the landlords were upheld by the Supreme Court in the case of Mr Salveson. Uh, uh, and and uh, that is the uh, wider context in which the corrections proposed in this order are being made. But as the Cabinet Secretary um, has been um, at pains to say and to explain uh, the current reviews on tenancy relations and so on and absolute right to buy are not material to the corrections in law being proposed today. We should acknowledge that that debate uh, continues in a different form. We should hope that the painful experience of the last 10 years in this matter can lead to a calm and respectful debate and the decisions on the interests of maintaining and improving efficient production on our farmlands should be central to the outcome of this discussion and that contractual arrangements between landlords and tenants can be regularised and lessons learned from this important and expensive episode. Alec Ferguson. May I make a brief comment, um, Confida, because I would not agree with almost everything that has been said around this table today, but I do think one of the lessons that we have to give cognizance to, if I could put it that way, is that whenever something like a right to buy is discussed or mentioned or brought into the debate, it is surely inevitable that those who might be affected by such a move, even if it has only been discussed theoretically, will take steps to protect what they already have. And I do feel that one of the lessons that has, we should have learned over the last 10 years is that you, you cannot float these ideas and, or bring them into debate without consequences. And I do think that that is really what's brought us to where we are today. I absolutely agree with what the Cabinet Secretary said. None of us, and I don't think any of the stakeholders, want to be where we are. And I share the Cabinet Secretary's aspirations and hope that this finds us a way through this. But I do think we need to bear that in mind as this debate moves forward. And I agree with you, it needs to move forward in a balanced and, and reasonable manner. But I would repeat the point, you cannot float these ideas or theories without there being consequences. That's good to have on the record. Any other comments that people have to make? 
Jim Hume. A very small one. I appreciate the Minister uh, and, and his team and all the work that they've done with this remedial order. Um, I, I suppose I would be an NFU uh, activist back in those days and remember many tenants uh, having some uh, very uh, disturbing times. So that's, that's a scar that, that's still there. But just to bear in mind, uh, with all views on, on all sides, etc., there, there has been a trust that, that has lost and uh, from what I see, there is a lot of land being held back uh, because of, as I said, a, a lack of trust. So if we can all bear in mind in the future going forward, if we can try and get the trust back between the, the tenant and the landlord, we can hopefully have a, a market for letting land, uh, yeah. and which is obviously the best way for young and new entrants to access into, into agriculture and, and the wider rural economy. So, uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to add, in view of the remarks from the um, Convener and um, Alex Ferguson, that while I understand what's being said by Alex Ferguson about um, that, that people will protect what they already have, if we're talking about balance, we have to also acknowledge that um, tenants um, and those who want to get into um, agriculture are in a different position. And... I, I wouldn't want to feel that um, I was going to be shying away from looking at the future because of um, that issue around protection of what's already there, although I respect people who, who work well in the land, on the land. Okay. Um, if there are no other comments, then, I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up if he feels he needs to. Listen very closely to all the comments from around the, the committee table, and many good points have been made. And I, I certainly agree with much of what's been said, and may have a slight different emphasis on some other issues. But uh, they, they are difficult issues. We're talking about you know balancing the interests of various sectors in Scotland, but trying to achieve the, the ultimate outcome of ensuring our, our land is used productively uh, for the public interest, and also that uh, there's. Uh, an opportunity for new entrants to come into agriculture because we need new generations working the land. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to produce food as a country or, or look after our landscapes. Uh, that's an ongoing challenge, which I have struggled with since day one of taking up this post. Uh, and, of course, there's many other reviews underway just now that will influence that debate going forward. Uh, but we all have to learn lessons from this particular episode. Uh, and uh, hopefully we now have a way of putting this behind us and moving forward. And uh, on that note, I formally move the motion. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. So therefore, I put the question on the motion. That is, the question is that the motion S4M 09333 in the name of Richard Lockhead be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. I would confirm, therefore, that the, uh, the result and that the committee's report will confirm the outcome of the debate. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for coming along this morning, <coughs> and we hope we're able to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next meeting is on the 26th of March. The committee will take evidence on CAP and SRDP from the Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Just to have it now. And we're going to clear the public gallery and move into private. Thank you. <laughs>